Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I have today an amazing opportunity to have an interview with our dear guest, Professor Lawrence Reed, before he gives a lecture uh, in our Maria Curie Skłodowska University. And first of all, on behalf of uh, our university, I would like to thank you very much for this uh, chance for the visit to our city, to Lublin, and willingness to participate in this um, interview and then give a lecture. This is not your first visit to Poland. What are your general impressions uh, of these visits and how would you assess the changes that have taken place over these few decades in Poland? Well, thank you, Agata, for having me and also for the university uh, for uh, sponsoring my lecture. I'm pleased to be here. I grew to love Poland in my first visit, uh, which was in November of 1986, a very different time. Uh, and even though the changes are immense in the decades since, uh, I love uh, Poland and the Polish people more than ever. Some of the characteristics that I've come to appreciate in the Polish people are courage, uh, and this is a very historical characteristic. Poles have exhibited immense courage as a nation and as individual people going back many, many decades. Uh, and that's a big reason why ultimately you prevailed and secured your liberty after years of uh, living under Soviet uh, domination. Uh, Poles are also, in spite of all the hardships they've endured over the centuries, uh, among the friendliest people in the world. And so you combine uh, a welcoming friendliness with uh, freedom and you see what you have today. Uh, lots of vibrant life and color and activities and smiling people. And um, uh, it's just a, a wonderful place. I, I wish you were not so far away. <laughs> yes, unfortunately. <laughs> Thank you very much for your kind words. As you are well aware, we are currently having a tense situation in the East. Very often in economic history, this has led to a further expansion of government intervention mm -hmm. in the economy. And actually this is currently happening in Poland, among other things, in the form of an increase in the government deficit and public debt, high inflation or rising taxes and regulations. What do you think? Is it possible to effectively pursue liberal, market-oriented policies in such difficult times? Well, I believe it's not only possible, it is uh, uh, an absolute uh, obligation. Uh, we know from history that when the state expands its uh, influence, its control, that very rarely does it return fully to the freedoms uh, the people had before that expansion. So, uh, as Ben Franklin in America said more than 200 years ago, the price of freedom is eternal vigilance. And while it's true that certain emergencies, temporary emergencies may require actions of government that we would not favor in normal times, we must be very quick to say to the government, uh, take no more in the way of our liberties or our money than is necessary to meet the emergency. And once it's over, be quick to return uh, those freedoms and that money and balance your budget and practice sound fiscal uh, uh, policy. So um, I don't deny that there are emergencies like today's that require certain measures, but I think we should be vigilant to make sure that uh, government doesn't keep uh, uh, the control and the influence and the spending that it's now engaging in after the emergency has passed. I understand. In your works, you pay a lot of attention to economic history. You have written, for example, about ancient Rome. Um, is it possible to find any similarities between the economic problems of the ancient world and the present day, despite such a significant passage of time? Yes, I think the lessons uh, from ancient Rome uh, cry loudly to us down through the centuries. 
And that is especially true of the period of the Roman Republic. Uh, there, the parallels between today's society and what the Roman Republicans endured is, I think, most uh, evident. Roman history is divided uh, into a roughly 500-year periods, two of them. The first 500 years was the period of the Republic with its uh, essential liberties, rule of law, uh, protections of the rights to property and, and other measures. It wasn't perfect. Rome had slavery, but uh, there was a greater degree of freedom for its people than it had endured ever before or that any other country had. The second period, the 500-year period of the imperial autocracy or empire, is a, was a very different place. The parallels we see today are more with the, uh, the old Roman Republic where people came to appreciate the importance of liberty, of keeping government constra constrained, and the importance of personal character. Uh, but then the problem was that over time, Romans abandoned those ideals. And they came to think that the state uh, could be a fountain of free goodies. Uh, they were less interested in the long term and more interested in the short term and just what advantages they could gain for now, even if it meant uh, problems for future generations. And that's when freedom began to erode. And ultimately, the Republic uh, dissolved into uh, civil strife, conflict, uh, the uh, assault on personal liberty, until finally the first emperor emerged and he ruled as if uh, he had uh, virtually every power of government at his disposal. So freedom is a very rare thing in history. The Romans achieved it and possessed it for several hundred years, uh, but uh, it requires eternal vigilance because the history of mankind is mostly the history of serfdom, of slavery, of government in charge of everything. And uh, that's a, a terrible thing we have to guard against. Perhaps you hear this question very often, but I have to ask for your opinion. Why, despite the undoubted advantages of capitalism in improving the quality of life of societies, mm -hmm do people still succumb to the charm of state interference yeah. in the economy by, for example, expanding social programs? It's so tempting, isn't it, uh, for people to say, give me something now. If you explain to them, but the problem with that is that uh, more people will demand the same, you will work less diligently yourself, people will begin to uh, uh, sit back and relax and let others do the work for them and before long the government uh, will, be, will find itself in a fiscal nightmare. That requires for people to think long term but social welfare programs are really a grasp for the here and now, for the present. Give me something today uh, and send a bill to future generations. It takes uh, a degree of personal character for people to say, I'm going to resist that. I'm going to think of my children and their children. I'm not going to put the state in a position where it has to scramble to find the money to pay for all these demands. Because ultimately, when they're in that position, they take your liberties, they destroy the currency, and they take a welfare state and turn it into a tyranny. Um, so we have to get people to think less of the current temptations and more of the long-run implications of what they are proposing. We talked about the Romans. The Romans did the same thing. They set up a welfare state, and at first they thought, well, this doesn't cost very much. This is okay. Uh, There's a few people getting something from the many, but it continues to grow until the many are extracting benefits from fewer and fewer uh, people who work. That's not sustainable, and it usually leads to chaos and economic uh, disaster. I understand. I have a question. How do you assess the degree of economic freedom in the USA today compared to the early 21st century? Oh, uh, that's a great question, and one of, uh, that prompts a lot of concern on the part of people like me who believe in liberty. 
I think America is uh, losing its economic liberties, and that's especially true in this uh, administration of, of Joe Biden. He seems to favor more government as a solution to every problem. More spending, more controls, more regulations, more uh, deficits, uh, more spending. Uh, and that is not a sustainable policy in the long run. And even in the short run, it's little more than cynical vote buying. It's using the public treasury to buy support uh, from gullible voters. That's no way to build a free and strong republic. So uh, the present administration ought to be studying America's founders because they laid out uh, a, a plan for society that uh, has worked, that, it, uh, that puts people in charge of their own lives and keeps government uh, uh, constrained. But this administration is not interested in that, unfortunately. And because of that, I think it will be replaced. Okay. I see. One of your most popular books is titled, Was Jesus a Socialist? Could you outline, in just a few sentences, mm -hmm. why those who share this view are wrong? Okay, <laughs> there's nothing in the New Testament, nothing in the words that Jesus ever spoke that suggests he would be sympathetic to the economics or the ethics of socialism. He said he came to fulfill the law, and by that he meant the Mosaic law, typically uh, the Ten Commandments would be the, uh, the centerpiece of that. And the Eighth Commandment says, thou shalt not steal. It does not say thou shalt not steal unless the other person has more than you do. It doesn't say thou shalt not steal unless uh, you're absolutely convinced you can spend it better than the person who earned it. Or thou shalt not steal unless you hire a politician to do the stealing for you. Uh, and Jesus was approached uh, more than once by people who wanted him to redistribute the wealth. In the uh, book of Luke, a man approaches him and says, uh, Master, speak to my brother that he divideth the inheritance with me. And Jesus' reply was not anything like, oh, well, we have to make sure you have an equal distribution. He said, man, who made me a judge or divider over you? Take heed and beware of covetousness. And elsewhere you find in the New Testament uh, that Jesus is focusing on what's in your heart not what's in your bank account. And he makes it plain whether or not you are accepted into heaven has nothing to do with the size of your bank account. And it has very little to do with the earthly works you may perform. Uh, he was interested in what was in your heart. And the big question was, do you accept him as your savior? Uh, if he came back today and spoke to an audience and he said uh, something like this, well, you know, I said, be concerned about the poor. So tell me now, what did you do for the poor? If you raised your hand and said to him, well, I voted for the politicians who said they would take care of that, I don't think Jesus would be impressed. I think he would say, I didn't tell you to push that onto the government. I didn't tell you to hire somebody to steal from others, to give to anybody. I said, you do what you can to assist uh, the needy around you. There was nothing about Jesus that required government to do anything. The last question I have for you. A few years ago, you also wrote an essay on the life and scientific career of Maria Curie Skłodowska. We published uh, this essay on the website of our university as well. What do you think about the role of women in the modern world in the context of entrepreneurship, conducting business, and science? Uh, Maria Sklodowska is one of my heroes. And I have written not only about her, but about many women in business and in all aspects of life. Uh, I don't think there's anything about being a woman that says you must be confined to this or that profession or activity uh, because that's for a woman and, and everything else is for a man. I think women, just like men, are individuals. They have their own goals, ambitions, and character traits. And if a woman chooses to enter the world of entrepreneurship, I think we should be encouraging. And there have been so many uh, great women in entrepreneurial history and in other aspects of life. 
So I think it's a great thing in, in modern civilization that we are more welcoming today uh, to more roles for women based upon their personal choices. I would like to thank you very much mm -hmm. for this amazing opportunity to have this interview with you. It was great pleasure and honor. And I wish you amazing stay and visit here in our city, Lublin. You're very thank kind, you very Agata. Much. Thank you very much. It's a wonderful place. I wish I could uh, be here a lot longer time, but you've already helped to make it a very pleasant visit. Thank, thank you. you very much. Mm -hmm.